Hi guys, we're going to talk about chapter 17. This is going to cover somatic symptom disorders. Soma comes from the Greek word for body. Somatization is the psychological and emotional expression of stress through physical symptoms. So instead of feeling anxious, depressed, or irritable, individuals will experience head, back, and chest pain, maybe even paralysis, unexplained skin rashes, and other symptoms. So let's get started here. So we've defined somatization, expression of stress through physical symptoms that are often manifested of psychological and emotional distress. So they're experiencing and reporting bodily symptoms that have no pathological basis, attributing them to a disease and seeking medical attention for them. We can take a holistic approach, which is a multidimensional interplay of biological, psychological, and sociocultural needs and its effects on somatization. While it's important for psychiatric nurses to understand somatic disorders, patients do not usually seek psychiatric care for their symptoms. Typically, primary care and other medical settings encounter these individuals Therefore, it's important for nurses who work outside of psychiatric settings to be aware of the influence of environment, stress, individual lifestyle, a support network, and coping skills of each patient. When we think about cultural considerations, um, we want to think about the type and frequency of somatic symptoms because that's going to vary across cultures. In certain cultures, Certain physical symptoms are believed to be a result of spells being cast upon them. So our spell-bound individuals often seek the help of traditional healers in addition to modern medical staff. The medical provider may diagnose a non-life-threatening somatic symptom disorder, whereas the he traditional healer may offer an entirely different explanation and prognosis. The individual may not show improvement and the, until the traditional healer removes the spell. It's important for primary care providers evaluating immigrants to be aware of the possible link between somatization symptoms reported by the patient and undisclosed traumatic experiences. Some of the disorders include somatic symptom disorder, illness anxiety disorder, previously known as hypochondria, conversion disorder, and cognitive factors affecting medical condition. Two under conscious control somatic uh, symptom disorders, um, unlike the four that we talked about on the previous slide, these two conditions are under conscious control, and that's factitious disorder and malingering. And we'll get to these as we get close out this chapter. So somatic symptom disorder can be very distressing for the patient. They're focused on the somatic or physical symptoms, such as pain or fatigue, becomes excessive, and they become preoccupied and fearful. These people will tend to seek help from multiple providers because they can't find a root for their pain or fatigue. So then the physician is looking for the biological cause, which cannot be found. When no answers are given to the patient, they find a different doctor to go to, so they're doctor to doctor to doctor. The patient's suffering is very authentic. They are not making the symptoms up, but it's how their anxiety and feelings are affecting their emotional state. Many times these patients have trouble functioning because of the pain and fatigue they are experiencing. Remember that this is a, this is a physical experience of the emotional pain. So guidelines for nursing care include developing a strong therapeutic relationship, providing education, um, providing that consistent reassurance for the patient, supporting the family if possible, encouraging a healthy lifestyle, resisting the temptation to concentrate on the psychosocial issue too early in that planning process, and really um, 
concentrating on those bodily symptoms, and then focusing on the development of self-compassion and internal locus of control. Some treatment modalities, a strong supportive approach is helpful for reducing fears. We want to avoid unnecessary or repetitive diagnostics. Possible hypnotherapy has shown great efficacy. CBT in conjunction with medication may be beneficial. Tricyclic antidepressants or RTCAs such as amitriptyline and uh, SSRIs such as Prozac have been used with some success. Illness anxiety disorder is similar to hypochondriac. This is the misinterpretation of physical sensations. Maybe they start with a little headache, and then before you know it, they have a brain tumor. Uh, preoccupation with having an or acquiring serious illness for at least six months. So these patients are extremely worried and fearful about the possibility of having a disease. If somatic symptoms are present, they are usually very mild in nature. They are anxious about their health and will almost obsessively talk about health and possible illnesses. Some of these patients are care seekers and some are care avoiders. As far as treatment modalities for this disorder, we can think about pharmacotherapy, which includes medications that may be used to provide symptomatic measures like our NSAIDs, laxatives, um, are just a couple. ECT, especially those with depression, maybe find this beneficial. And then CBT, um, particularly the internet delivered cognitive behavioral therapy, the ICBT, provides effective and also accessible treatment options for people with illness anxiety. Conversion disorder is a little bit different than the others that we've talked about. It is neurological symptoms in the absence of a neurological diagnosis. So a lot of times we see motor or sensor issues. It could be as extreme as paralysis, blindness, um, movement or gait disorders, numbness, paresthesia, loss of vision or hearing, or episodes resembling some type of epilepsy. We do hear labella indifference, um, which is one of the most striking aspects of conversion disorder. Um, many patients show a lack of emotional concern about often dramatic symptoms, which means they really don't care one way or another if they have it or not. It's just kind of a fact like, oh my gosh, I'm blind, and they don't really freak out about it. Unlike you or I, if I became paralyzed or blind, I would totally be freaking out, and these patients just don't. So guidelines for nursing care include developing that therapeutic relationship, avoiding direct confrontation of the conversion symptom, make sure we're providing reassurance and support, encouraging socialization, and really exploring those alternative alternative and adaptive coping mechanisms. As far as treatment modalities, um, we can think about body-oriented psychological therapy, which utilizes nonverbal expressive behavior, body awareness, and movement to facilitate a change process linking the expression of emotions. The DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy encourages skills to target emotional dysregulation, distress tolerance, and interpersonal conflicts. Psychodrama is the use of role play. And then physical therapy not only helps with increased function, but it can improve additional psychological support via ongoing positive caring relationships and physical therapist. There are a lot of psychological factors that can affect medical conditions. Page 319 in your book has a really large list of this. these. Um, there's a growing evidence that links psychiatric disorders to cardiovascular disease, 
A lot of times we th see this in relationship with depression, high stress, or even high anxiety. Peptic ulcer is a lot of times associated with high stress, increased tension, and then cancer is associated with prolonged intensive stress. So those cognitive factors affect our medical conditions, and you can look at those in your book. So what are some guidelines for nursing care? Again, the therapeutic relationship, teaching the importance of positive effective responses, um, consistently assessing adverse childhood experiences are those ACEs, include concept or resilient coping, and then focusing on the patient's connection to family, friends, and community. So let's apply the nursing process. We're going to start with assessment. Um, each of these assessment piece, pieces, um, are, we're going to try to collect as much data as possible. Most of our patients with somatic symptom disorders don't realize the underlying cause of the issue. So we're gonna sit down with our patient, we're gonna talk about their pain, what's going on in their life that is stressful, and they will attempt to shut our conversation down really quickly, but it's important to have those conversations with your patient to let them know how our body and minds work together so we can start finding the root of the issues. As far as, far as uh, psychosocial factors, um, table 17.2 on page 322 really gives great areas to assess for those, that psychosocial assessment. Coping skills, knowing how the patient has dealt with adversity in the past will really help provide how coping skills have been beneficial. Spirituality and religion may play a role. Support from priests, pastors, rabbis, or other religious leaders may be indicated. Secondary gains, nurses need to try and identify what secondary gains the patient might be receiving from these symptoms. Secondary gains are benefits because of the symptoms they have. The patient ends up playing the sick role and aren't able to perform their normal functions in the family or at work or in social settings. So we wanna look at what personal benefit are they getting for having these symptoms? They once washed the car or mowed the lawn, and now they can't do that anymore. Someone is doing it for them. How do we form that in a question to get the information? Because we can't just say, so what are people doing for you now? Um, questions that we can think about are, what are you unable to do now that you used to be able to do? or how has this problem affected your life? This helps us get down to the root of our patient's issue without being judgmental or having them become defensive. Cultural considerations we've talked about a little bit earlier. Um, symptoms again can vary across cultures and some cultures may believe that spells have been placed on them and they may need to seek a healer. As far as communication, their communication may be slower because they have trouble communicating their emotional needs. They are able to talk about the physical symptoms, but they struggle with those feelings. And then self-assessment. Um, nurses, it's really important because you can see how you might become very frustrated with these patients because the physical symptoms are not matching how they sh should. Uh, you may feel like the patient's just drug seeking or looking for some sympathy, and you have other patients that really need your attention. Try to remember as nurses that these patients' symptoms that they are experiencing are very real for them. After thorough assessment, prioritization is next. Uh, we'll analyze our data, and then we'll come up with our priorities. And effective coping is the biggest priority and we need to help these patients cope better. You can see there's other um, priorities there too, and effective coping is the big one. Outcomes are those goals that we want our patients to meet. Shared decision-making um, we know helps our patient participate in attaining those goals. Remember, goals must be realistic and attainable. We're gonna structure our outcomes in small steps so that patients see concrete evidence of progress. 
Implementation, uh, we're going to do some psychosocial support, which is going to include coping skills such as assertiveness training, cognitive reframing, problem solving skills, and social supports. Nurses can help patients with uh, by focusing on strengths and reinforcing skills and promoting those self care activities. Assertive training is often identified as an appropriate teaching for patients with somatic symptom. Use of assertiveness techniques gives patients a direct mean of getting needs met, thereby decreasing the need for the somatic symptom. Teaching an exercise regimen, such as doing range of motion exercises for 15 to 20 minutes, taking regular walks, can help the patient feel in control, increase those endorphin levels, and help decrease anxiety. As far as case management, remember we talked about them being doctor shoppers. Um, that is very common. Patients may go from provider to provider, clinic to clinic, hospital to hospital, hoping to establish a physical basis for their distress. Um, they'll have repeated CT scans, MRIs, and other diagnose, diagnostic tests. Case management can help limit healthcare costs associated with these visits. Um, the patient who establishes a relationship with a case manager often feels less anxiety because the patient has someone to contact and knows that they are a healthcare expert is their partner. Six key elements recommended for healthcare providers in working with patients with somatic symptom disorder include um, providing continuity of care, avoiding unnecessary procedures, providing frequent brief and regular visits, always conducting a physical exam, avoiding disparaging comments, meaning that we're not going to say your symptoms are all in your head. That's a disparaging comment for these patients. And then making sure we're setting reasonable therapeutic goals. And then we'll evaluate um, based on clear, realistic, measurable outcomes. Did they meet their goals? Um, families frequently report relatively high satisfaction with outcomes, even without total eradication of the patient's symptoms. As far as treatment modalities, um, psychological therapies can include CBT and then coping strategies that preclude somatization. Remember, our analysis was ineffective coping, so some of the therapies are going to be just developing those coping strategies. All right, so let's move into um, factitious disorder. Um, this is artificially, deliberately, and dramatically fabricated symptoms or self-inflicted injury. The goal for this patient is to assume that sick role. They're very compulsive. Um, they consciously concealed the truth of the illness, um, and they um, may play um, that illness off um, to the physician and or the psychi psychiatrist. Um, this is very, this is a very frustrating disorder to work with. These are fake fabricated symptoms to get attention or to assume that sick role. If you have seen the act, um, it's about Gypsy Rose. Um, I think it's on, I don't know, Netflix, one of the social things. Anyway, Gypsy Rose, um, her mom was um, factitious disorder by proxy. So you may have heard of Munchausen's disease. So this is Munchausen's disease. Um, if it's on yourself, it's Munchausen or factitious. If it's um, on someone else, it's Munchausen by proxy or proxy. Um, so that's what these are, types of factitious disorders imposed on self or imposed on another. Um, if it's imposed on the self, this can include demanding and requesting specific treatments and inter interventions for themselves. If it's on another, this is where the caregiver deliberately falsifies illness and a vul vulnerable dependent. Um, caregivers can receive rewards such as insurance money or compensation um, or they just sometimes do it for the attention and the excitement um, to perpetuate, perpetuate the uh, relationship with the healthcare provider. Unnecessary medical visits, harmful medical procedures can be performed. So when I go back to Gypsy Rose, 
Um, mom basically um, told her she couldn't walk. She was in a wheelchair. She had a G-tube. She had feeding. It was a mess. She was a mess. Um, come to find out this was factitious disorder imposed on another. Really interesting story. As far as treatment modalities, um, CBT, focusing on childhood trauma, trauma. People with this disorder do not benefit from medical interventions such as antidepressants or antipsychotics. Malingering is the last one that we'll talk about. Um, it's a condition related to factitious disorder. So same thing, except the patient is using this for secondary gains, typically for financial gains, disability compensation, um, committing fraud against insurance companies, maybe they're obtaining prescription medications, or they're even evading military service or receiving some type of reduced prison sentence. This disorder is associated typically with antisocial, narcissistic, and borderline personality disorders. And again, it's conscious fabrication of an illness um, for that secondary gain, and that's malingering. And that concludes chapter 17. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we will chat about it in class. Thanks, guys.